We now move to questions of agriculture and rural development. Question number 11 has been withdrawn. Michael Copeland. Mr. Copeland. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, I've got a can call there. For clarity, insurance is a reserve matter, and therefore the work associated with the replacement for the statement of principles and flood insurance is being taken forward by Westminster ministers and their officials, with obviously input from here. The new arrangements for flood insurance are currently being brought onto the statute book via the Water Bill. This draft legislation is at an advanced stage, with commencement due in early 2015. In order to ensure that the arrangements are suitable for here, I, along with officials from my department, have had regular contact with the representatives of the Association of British Insurers, DEFRA ministers and officials from departments in England, Scotland and Wales. Specifically, I met with the Association of British Insurers as far back as November 2012 to discuss potential options and they have recently been in contact with my officials to arrange an update meeting. Given my concerns about home insurance, I have also written to DEFRA ministers on a number of occasions stressing the need to ensure that home insurance, including provision for flooding, remains available and affordable for all residents in the north of Ireland and that this is adequately reflected in any agreed solution. Michael Copeland. Mr. Copeland. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, the Minister will be aware that the way to reduce insurance premiums is to reduce risk. And we still have a very questionable situation where, for example, water in Belfast Lock is the responsibility of DECAL. Once it enters the Collins Water River, it's the responsibility of Rivers Agency. Once it overflows the bank, it's the responsibility of DOA. And once it comes onto the roads, it's the responsibility of DRD. Uh, can the Minister update us on what degree of cooperation has taken place these, but between all these departments to ensure that the risk is minimised and therefore the premiums? Well, obviously, there's, there's um, very strong links and very strong coordination across all departments, and I think that's been evidenced in, in some of the situations that we've found ourselves in over the last, even if you look back to the last number of years, and even the threat from um, the coastal and tidal flooding. So there is very strong links. I have always said that I'm open to taking a look at the, the bigger picture around who strategically is best placed to take forward the whole remit of flooding in general. But I think that needs to be done in the context of the wider discussion around departmental roles, responsibilities, and as part of that wider discussion, I just don't think we should pick and choose now um, areas for, for movement. So there is strong links. I very much welcome that. We'll continue to have that. But as I said, I'm very open to any discussions in the future around um, how that's actually formatted and which department takes the lead. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? Can I also ask the Minister just what specifically DARD can do and what are the specific options that she's referring to in relation to her discussions with the uh, British Insurers Association? As I said, there's um, quite a number of discussions we've had, and particularly I was keen to stress um, with DEFRA that any solution that's found, and with the Association of Insurers, any solution that's found is reflective of our needs locally, because there's a particular problem, or a bigger problem, if you like, in England compared to what the, um, we would have in terms of scale. So it's important that our um, householders weren't penalised as a result of that. So we made that very strong and had the, those discussions over the last couple of years. So in moving forward, um, I think there's a more formalisation of um, the levy that's um, been imposed on all householders, there's already an existing levy in place of £10.50, and this legislation is looking towards, um, I suppose, um, stabilising that and putting it into legislation. So there's quite a number of arrangements being taken forward, and we're going to have a lot more discussion on this as it comes to the House um, for more discussion. But we're talking about 2015 for an implementation date. Thomas Buchanan, not in his place. Lord Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Question number three. The Department has delivered a record payment performance for the 2013 scheme year, with 99% of claims finalised to date. More farmers received their single farm payment in December 2013 than ever before. The value of single farm um, payments made so far is £264.7 million and is a vital element of farm incomes. I am pleased to announce that the results of all remote sensing inspections have been processed. Payments have been issued to the businesses concerned. In fulfilment of my department's commitment to the industry, payments have been made to the inspected businesses two months earlier than the last year and four months earlier than the year before that. Currently, there are 357 outstanding single farm payment claims from the 2013 scheme year. These claims are not yet finalised due to a variety of reasons, including probate proceedings, bank account details not being provided by businesses and disputes between businesses concerning land. The resolution of these claims is being pursued on an ongoing basis, but in the great majority of these cases, delay is due to factors outside of the Department's control. Lord Morrow. Mr Morrow. Well, 
Mr. Speaker, we are speaking here today about those who have not received their payments, not about those who have received their payments. And I have noted that the Minister can give no comfort at all as to when these final payments will be made. Uh, does the Minister accept that there has been a lot of hardship caused due to the fact that these payments have not been made? And does she also acknowledge that it is incumbent upon her department to do everything that she can to ensure that this debacle ends as quickly as possible? Well, perhaps the, the member wasn't listening properly, but I clearly said in my answer that all cases who have been um, inspected by remote control sensing have been paid. We're talking about 99% of all claims being paid, and those remaining 357 claims that are yet to be paid are as a result of issues that are outside the department's control. So probate, so legal, legal issues that are being dealt with. So until we can get those, um, I mean, I think it's a very positive situation that we're in. And I've always repeatedly said that those people that were in the situation of having a remote control sense and inspection um, and, and who had been waiting for their payment, whilst we are in a better picture, we have more people paid this year than ever before. Year on year, the picture's getting better. I very much welcome that. I know the industry very much welcomes that. But I've always said that if you're in those category of people that were waiting to be paid, I understand the stress and the financial situation that you're in. I can give an assurance to all um, recipients of single farm payment that next year is going to be a better year again. We're going to continue to improve year on year. But the issues around people not providing bank details, that's far beyond my control or my department's control. So those are the issues that we'll continue to work with claimants to try and get those people paid. But I don't think anybody can walk away or ignore the fact that we are four months better year on year over the last couple of years. We're four months better positioned than we were in the past. So there's improvements every year, and next year will be even better again. Sean Lynch, Mr Lynch. What were the payments processing targets for December uh, 2013 and February 2014? Um, um, the, the payment target for December 2013 was 85% and we achieved 90%. 90 the payment target for February was 95% and we achieved almost 97%. And as I said, the total payment now is 99%. This is a positive picture, it's an improved picture, and it's only going to get better. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for, for your answers thus far. Minister, in terms of with the advent of the new cap, what consideration have, has been given to proposals for advance payments and single farm payment? I've always said that um, we hope to be in a position where we can make advance payments, and obviously that will be part of the consideration of moving forward. For us, I think to be able to get to the position where we can do that, we need to have more inspection cases dealt with by remote control sensing. So we've really ramped up the numbers over the last couple of years. Next year, I intend to increase that again. And obviously learning from some of the, um, I suppose the experiences of this year, getting a better spread of how, of how that's done. Um, once we're able to do that, and we have the majority, if not all cases done by remote control sensing, then we'll be in a position to be able to pay advance payments, and I'm very open to being able to do that. I suppose the priority to date has always been just getting the majority of people paid as early as possible in December. And we'll continue to drive forward in that, but absolutely open to advance payments when we're in a position to be able to do it, and hopefully that will be over the next couple of years. Sean Swan. Mr. Thank Swan. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. She's highlighted that she understands that single farm payments are an essential cash flow pipeline for many farms. Can she give her assessment of what will happen to agriculture in Northern Ireland in general, should the Executive fail to agree a model for the future single farm payment, and on the 1st of August we go to that? Default position, which is a single region, and the and single region with no transition. Obviously, these are major decisions. Um, it's, it's significantly um, a massive change for the industry. People are watching very carefully as decisions are taken. They want clarification, uh, and rightly so. Um, to date, in, in the decisions that have been taken, we've been very um, anxious to make sure we get that message communicated and people fully understand the decisions that have been taken to date. In terms of the bigger decisions still to be taken, and I'm mindful of the need to have those taken sooner rather than later, and we're actively working through that. There is a political process, there's a process of government to go through, which we're actively doing, and then as soon as I'm able to confirm the rest of those decisions, then I'll be doing that. And as I said, I would hope that it'll be sooner rather than later that we're able to confirm for people what the future holds. This is an industry where there's massive potential. This is an industry which can grow. This is an industry that's asking this executive to support it. I want to see the going for growth strategy paper agreed. And let, us, let, let people see, let the industry see that this executive is serious about this industry. So there's a lot of work to be done, surely, but I'm, um, we're in the process of government and I hope to be able to get things clarified sooner rather than later. Alec 
Mr. Mosby. 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 The provisions in the Welfare of Animals Act 2011 um, strengthen the role of councils in dealing with local issues um, as dog wardens and environmental health officers previously dealt with dog control issues. <coughs> councils had experience and a presence in residential areas where most welfare offences in respect of domestic pets are likely to occur. The involvement of councils has been a major step forward as it is the first time the North has had a dedicated manpower resource to investigate animal welfare complaints in respect of non-farmed animals and a budget to fund this work. Councils enforce the Act on a regional basis through five groups. There are nine animal welfare officers who work across the whole of the North if necessary. These officers were appointed following an open competition, publicly advertised in line with council recruitment procedures. Essential and desirable criteria include relevant experience and qualifications in the professional care or management of handling or handling of animals. Successful applicants came from a variety of backgrounds with a range of skills. These officers have completed a rigorous training program compiled and delivered by the RSPCA, which has had many years' experience of animal welfare enforcement in England and Wales. Additional training in areas such as um, equine handling and evidence gathering has also been undertaken. They are supported by management, administrative and legal support, and depending on the circumstances of the case being investigated, they can also seek the services of veterinarians and specialist animal care providers with whom they have, con they have a contract. I am very encouraged by the positive approach taken by councillors and by the close and effective partnership working between councillors and DART officials in putting in place the necessary arrangements. Thank you. I thank the Minister first of all for her very comprehensive reply so far. Could I ask the Minister actually who or, or what organisation is specifically responsible for the enforcement of animal welfare issues in respect of non-farmed animals? The PSNI has responsibility for enforcement in respect of wild animals, animals fighting and welfare issues where other criminal activities are involved. Councils have responsibility for enforcement in respect of non-farmed animals such as domestic pets and horses. Councils have nine animal welfare officers to enforce the Act across the North. The powers in the Act allow the Council animal welfare officers to take a range of actions to address any animal welfare case. This includes providing advice, giving a warning, issuing a legally binding improvement notice or prosecution. The circumstances of each case will determine the most appropriate action. It is important that the PSNI councils and my department are involved in, an, in the enforcement of the Act as it provides a new duty of care and allows inspectors to issue improvement notices for animals not being properly cared for. This would not be appropriate work for the PSNI, however should the PSNI wish to investigate and prosecute any animal welfare complaint, the Act provides the powers for them to do so. And importantly, only the PSNI can make arrests in the matter where an offence has been committed under the Act. Campbell. Will the Minister make available senior officials from her department in the North West where a public representative like myself has been approached by a landowner who lived in England, the land was vacant but was used by others on which to graze uh, uh, animals and livestock uh, and some of those livestock perished because of neglect uh, and that landowner is seeking redress and seeking a resolution to the problem. Uh, upon return to the land in the North West. Will she ensure that after I have approached her department that our officials will be available to try and alleviate the position? I am the normal um, practice. If he contacts the department, I am sure officials will make themselves available to discuss an individual case. It is not appropriate for us to discuss it across the chamber today. Danny Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far, but she is probably aware that Cross Kennan Animal Sanctuary, which last year was trying to find homes for some 200 horses and animals, is now owed, um, yet still to be sorted, a large sum of money by Belfast City Council, and yet she is indicating that she is happy with the mechanisms. Will she use all the influence she has got on the executive and with councillors and others to ensure that councils get their contracts in place and pay so that they can look after the animals and that such places as Cross Cannon aren't put in danger? Cross Cannon do, uh, do a great job. Um, it's not for me to comment on their contractual issues with Belfast City Council. I don't think that would be appropriate. However, I'm hopeful that maybe they can get a solution. I know that there has been some public element to it also, but I just think it would be inappropriate for me to comment. It's suffice to say that I think in all these arrangements and all the contracts that councils have in terms of delivering the, uh, on the welfare of animals, I think it's important that um, everybody's very clear on their contractual um, responsibilities and the financial remuneration that, that, that is coming in. So I think suffice to say that, and I would leave it at that just in that, and I hope that they can resolve the dispute that they have with um, Belfast Council. 
Dominic Bradley. For me, I got a young coal. You can come back and listen now. I sucked a fragra. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Um, can I ask the minister, in the light of the recent uh, court cases and the widespread dissatisfaction that there has been with the lightness of sentences imposed, and given that the, the minister introduced the uh, uh, legislation, uh, will she raise this matter with the Minister of Justice and do so as a matter of urgency? Yeah, I, I mean, I have written to, in light of, I suppose, the, the public concern around the sentence, and particularly in relation to the East Belfast case, um, I wrote to both the Department of Justice, to the Minister of Justice, but also to the Lord Chief Justice around the sentencing guidelines. I think that um, we, what we have is a, a fit-for-purpose piece of legislation. However, when it comes to the actual sentencing, that's where, in my opinion, in this case, um, it, it fell down. So I've written to both parties. I intend to meet with the Minister of Justice also to have further discussions around how we can work together and how we can improve things. But I do believe that um, the, the key issue or the failing, particularly in these Belfast cases, was around the sentencing as opposed to the actual legislation that's in place. Judith Cochran. Mrs. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five, please. Going for Growth is the industry led strategic action plan developed by the Agri Food Strategy Board. Development of this plan is a priority one commitment in the programme for government, and agri food is also highlighted as a key growth sector in the executive's economic strategy. This demonstrates the importance of the sector and the key role it will play in rebalancing and rebuilding the North's wider economy. Going for Growth outlines significant targets to 2020, including an increase in sales outside the North by almost 2 billion to 4.5 billion. The report also targets an increase in turnover by 2.5 billion to 7 billion, increase in value added to 1 billion and 15,000 additional jobs. The report identifies significant opportunities for export growth with a focus on growing markets in the USA, Africa and the middle and the far east. I have already visited China to talk to officials about the quality and safety of our produce. In addition, the first and deputy first ministers have also recently visited Japan where they promoted our, food, our local food and drink. My department is also supporting access to new markets through the efforts of supply chain development and veterinary service. Most recently, Singapore announced it was opening its markets to beef from the north and northern beef sourced from southern cattle, and I'm confident that others will follow. Irrespective of the proposed markets, any growth must be sustainable, and I welcome the view of the Agri-Food Strategy Board that any growth must be based on sustainability and profitability for the entire supply chain, recognizing the importance that each part plays in producing high-quality, traceable food. I'm fully committed to delivering on going for growth, and along with the Deddy Minister, have bought I have brought proposals to the executive on the way forward for this important report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for her answer um, and welcome uh, the number of um, issues she's uh, um, already addressed there. Um, just specifically um, in relation to the increase in the agricultural exports, um, could the Minister um, detail any sort of other small programmes that she may have in place um, to encourage that and what funding might be in place um, and how she would uh, plan to monitor um, the success of those programmes going forward? At the core of the, of the going for growth strategy is obviously in the export sales and the export market and I think very much there's an, a collective executive effort to target those markets and you can see that by the visits from, that I've been involved with but also the way from DFM have been involved with and indeed the Daddy Minister has been involved. So it's about getting out there, it's about selling our words if you like, it's about promoting what we have, a clean green image, a fantastic product that people desire. So for us that, that, that's a, the, the job for the executive. In terms of moving forward and how we actually support the industry and actually funding the going for growth um, strategy, a lot of the um, areas of work, which now we have taken forward quite a number of areas of work, I'm not just sitting waiting for the executive approval, there's quite a number of, um, whilst they're smaller things, they all add up to the bigger picture that we have been able to take forward. But in terms of supporting the going for growth and the financing of it, obviously um, the transfer of money that I would have been able to take forward from the rural development programme from pillar one to pillar two transfer, which was blocked. If I had been able to do that, we would have been in a better financial position in terms of funding um, some of these measures which we'd like to take forward. However, I'm still committed, very much committed, to the Going for Growth document and for delivering on what we've set out, particularly around the supports for farm, um, the farm industry. So in terms of the actual um, the shape of that, that's what we're working through now. Until we have a better um, understanding of the financial position, it's harder to put, um, I suppose, more meat in the bones in terms of what it is that we're doing. But the member is on the, on the Agriculture Committee and I'm happy to make sure that she's kept informed in terms of decisions as we take them. 
Paul Frew. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how she expects anything to grow, let alone farm businesses, when she procrastinates on the, the cap reform uh, issues? Why has she not brought proposals to the executive to give them a chance uh, to assess them? And why has she turned her face away from the farming community and the farming organisations that they represent? And why has she advised her colleagues and her party not to attend public meetings? Many questions there. Um, I said it earlier, that cap reform is major decisions. There's major decisions to be taken. And as I have taken every decision, I've tried to put as much clarity out there at each stage because I understand that farmers are concerned about their future and what this means for them. So we've taken quite a number of decisions. You don't need me to detail them now. But we've taken quite a number of decisions and we've put that out there in the public domain. There are still some core issues which need to be addressed. There is a political process in place. Your own um, leader of your party, actually in question time just before myself, talked about how there's discussions ongoing. That's something that we're working our way through. There's a process of government that we have to go through. I want to be able to take these decisions sooner rather than later. But I'll take decisions that are fair, that are based on equality. I have listened. I have been involved in so many consultations around this, uh, around cap reform. We have engaged, we've had over 850 responses. There's been numerous public meetings. So views have been very well heard and very well heard. So I'll take decisions based on, on equality. I'll take decisions based on the best uh, for the future of this industry. I'm very much committed to this industry being able to grow. That was the reason why I brought forward the Agri-Food Strategy Report, the reason why I made that firmly on the agenda, the reason why I said this department's an economic department. So I don't think anybody can question my commitment to this industry. There are big decisions to be taken. I'll not be forced into taking them just to please some people. I'll take decisions whenever they're right to be taken and whenever they're fair and whenever they're equal. But I will also be mindful of the process of government that I have to go through and those discussions are ongoing. Joe Barton. Thank you, Speaker. the Minister's answers thus far. Can the Minister state if going for a growth implementation plan has been sufficiently agreed with time scales and monies attached? And is that contingent upon agreement on the cap pillar one? And is the Minister still committed to a single zone region with perhaps a short transition period of four years? Well, I mean, I said it earlier, the going for growth um, paper has been with the executive since December. Um, mm. Both myself and, and the Deputy Minister signed off on it, and it's been with the executive, and I'm hopeful for a discussion that sooner rather than later. I'm frustrated that it hasn't been discussed yet, that we don't have a response for the industry. I don't think that's good enough. I think that the industry are sitting waiting. We've done a fantastic piece of work that's been done. It's now up to this executive to show that they support the industry in moving forward. They support the growth that's there and the potential that's there. So we'll work our way through that. I hope to have those discussions. Um, there's ongoing discussions in terms of uh, coming to the executive, but hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later because we cannot miss the opportunity of creating 15,000 extra jobs growing sales by 60%. The potential is there. It's up to this executive to support it. I said earlier I wanted to transfer money in, which would have been used to part fund some of the work that we would do undergoing for growth. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So those discussions are ongoing. Given the fact that it was blocked, the executive needs to step up to the mark for the industry. The executive needs to put the money up front, centre stage for this industry, which has got fantastic potential. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, almost a year after uh, the publication of the strategy and with all the time in between and the problems with the agri-loan scheme, to many it has, seems to have been a wasted 12 months with virtually nothing to show for it. Minister, it's time for honest answers. What priority do you and the Deputy Minister really place on the strategy and do you accept the longer both departments string this out, the poorer our agricultural industry will be for it? I would hope that the members not suggest that I'm ever anything less than honest. I have said it very clearly. I'm very much wedded to this strategy. I want to see the executive deliver on it. I'm frustrated that there hasn't been an agreement to date. I'm hopeful that that will become in the near future. There's a fantastic um, piece of work that's been done. It's up to this executive now to deliver on it. And in terms of sitting back and waiting, we haven't sat back and, um, and waited to the executive agrees. There's quite a number of areas of work that has been uh, been already taken forward over the last year. We've had the deferral of the introduction of the export health charges um, that were identified in, uh, in the document as, as a barrier for the industry, an obstacle to export. We've had um, the proactively promoting our produce, as I said, right across the executive with all the visits to China, Japan, um, all the different markets that we're, that we're trying to, to reach into. 
We've had an increase in DARD um, funded postgraduate courses. We have created a dedicated um, contact point at AFBI to assist local people in terms of drawing down EU funding. So nobody's sitting back in their laurels waiting for the executive for, to, to uh, agree this piece of work. We need the financial um, backup to be able to deliver on some of the bigger um, key issues of the document, on the, of the strategy, but there's certainly been quite a lot of other work that's um, been taken forward in the meantime. And I'm hopeful that we can get agreement. And I think it's this executive, it's incumbent on this executive to, put their, to say to the industry, we support you, and here's the financial um, contribution to do it. Fira. Question number six, Cash de Rochelle the Hall. I met recently with the Commissioner for Public Appointments, John Keeney, and discussed with him in uh, his report into underrepresentation and lack of diversity in public appointments. As his report makes clear, women, young people, ethnic minorities, and people with disabilities are underrepresented on the boards of public bodies. I have instructed my department to initiate a review led by senior officials to address the underrepresentation of women on the boards of DARD's five non departmental public bodies and to prepare a report um, specifically recommending actions, goals and timetables. I believe that this work will also inform how we improve diversity more generally on our departmental um, public bodies and other um, fora for which my department is responsible. Paul Chirivan and Prager Shin Nagasan Nabarata Jaint. I welcome that answer and the work that has been done. Um, but we all know we need to get targets for um, increasing representation of women in public bodies. And I wonder if you could outline what DARD's targets are. Um, in 2011, DARD published its audit of inequalities and accompanying action plan, the, which runs from 2011 to 2016. And that action plan has two gender targets. By 2016, to improve representation by women on DARD, NDPBs and associated bodies to 50%. By 2016, to improve representation by women on internal decision-making teams, groups to achieve fair representation, 50-50. Um, and then in 2012, DARD published its strategic plan, which runs to 2020, which clearly sets out the direction for the department's work in coming years and the significant work streams. The strategy also reaffirms the department's commitment to equality and its Section 75 obligations and to working towards meeting the targets set out in the audit of inequalities. But I totally agree with the member in terms of targets. You have to have clear targets for people can work to them. I think for me, certainly, in um, meeting with the Commissioner, I certainly, um, I suppose, he presented a, a different way to look at things and actually how we actually recruit. Because if we don't have enough women coming forward, it's hard to select. We don't have, you can't select women from, if there's no women coming forward. So I think some of the areas that we need to look at, particularly around um, advertising, how, how um, descriptions are set out so people actually can see how they fit in and how actually they would probably be very naturally a, a good person for that role. So I think there's a number of challenges for all departments, but certainly I, I'm um, committed to taking that forward as a, as a key area of work and time ahead. Senator O'Brien, Mrs O'Brien. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I wonder, will the Minister consider following in the positive steps of my colleague, a Danny Kennedy, the Minister for Regional Development, a moving away from a what has become almost automatic reappointment of board members uh, for second terms and making all a reappointments subject to public a competition? That we're looking at, and I think that is um, key because if we are um, going to keep reappointing people, then how is there going to be any opportunity for any new people to come in? And particularly if we take on board what I said earlier to, uh, to Katrina, that if, if we look at how even some of these posts are advertised, that I think they're actually discourage people from coming forward. So I think we need to look at all those, and these can be very simple steps that we can take that hopefully will widen the pool of people that actually come forward, particularly women, ethnic minorities, young people, the groups that are absolutely underrepresented. Question 7, Mr. Speaker. In comparison with 2012, there has been no widespread damage to agricultural land as a result of waterlogging over the last 12 months. Waterlogging causes damage to agricultural land through a deterioration of soil structure and an increased risk of soil compaction. I recognise that there was um, wet weather conditions during the early part of 2013 which may have caused localised waterlogging damage to soils. However, the subsequent dry summer and autumn resulted in an improvement in soil structure which allowed agricultural land to recover naturally. The drier weather also gave farmers and growers the opportunity to take remedial action <coughs> such as soil aeration, soil, or subsoiling and drainage improvement works. These conditions lasted until most livestock was housed and this was meant that there was less damage caused by poaching compared with the previous autumn. The high rainfalls between December 2013 and March 2014 caused some localised waterlogging However, the impact on agricultural land was less than in 2012. This is because most livestock was housed during this period and less field work was needed as most crops were successfully harvested in the autumn. 
Looking ahead, if spring conditions continue to improve, then early season um, damage to agricultural land from water logging should be minimal. However, if needed, my department through the College of um, through CAFRI will support, uh, and, support and, and provide training to farmers and growers who are affected by poor weather conditions. We offer training to help farmers improve their knowledge of soil structure, compaction and drainage issues. In addition, CAFRI development advisors are available to meet the specific training needs of farmers in their local areas. Order, members, that includes all questions to the Minister. We now move to topical questions to the Minister. Questions number 5 and 10 has been withdrawn, and Patsy McLone and Jonathan Craig are not in their place. Declan McAleer. Mr. McAleer. Um, uh, question three, question three. Uh, can I ask the Minister for an update on the CAP decisions? As I said earlier, there have been a number of decisions that have been taken and we have tried to be um, very proactive in making sure that um, the people are aware of those decisions. We have the question answers on the website and that is actually um, updated fairly regularly given on the basis on the back of the questions that actually farmers are ringing in and asking for answers on. So we have made a number of um, uh, decisions around entitlements that all existing entitlements will be cancelled at the end of 2014 and new entitlements will be allocated in 2015. Entitlements held on the 15th of May will be used to calculate the initial value of, of entitlements allocated under cap reform. And the option to restrict the number of entitlements to the area of land declared in 2013 will not be used. We have um, set out some clarity around eligible land, around the minimum allocation of entitlements and claim size at three hectares, around the siphon on entitlement transfers, around the regional reserve, with um, clarification around greening. Um, around the small farmer scheme, around the active farmer test. So the, we've been able to, uh, particularly on those sort of more technical issues, we've been able to um, seek and, and provide clarification on those. I encourage farmers with any questions to, to feel free to contact us at any stage, and we will continue to update that Q&A because I do accept that it is, a, I suppose, a time of change and a time of concern when people are taking their business decisions in, in terms of um, what's right for them in the way forward. Well, I'd thank you, Minister, for a question, and I uh, wish to acknowledge that the, uh, and commend the progress that has been made to date on the cap reform. But the Minister will also be aware that there are very strong voices from areas such as the Spurns, where, where I represent, where farmers want a very fair, a fair outcome to cap reform. Can the Minister assure those farmers that this is her intention? Mr. Margaret. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, at the heart of um, my politics is equality, so in the heart of any decision I take, well, I will make sure that equality is at the core of that. I very much believe in this industry. I believe in fairness in the supply chain. I believe in supporting everybody who's in the industry. So any decisions that we take on the way forward will be based on all of those, all of those um, premises. I think f for me, I mean, it is a time of change, as I've said. I accept that people um, are, are worried about what it means for them. So the sooner we can have um, agreement, a uh, political agreement in terms of the decisions of moving forward, the better it will be for the industry. And I'm committed to making sure that we do that. Michael Bean. Mr. Michael Bean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wonder could I ask the Minister what action her and her department is taking um, to uh, speed up the processing of the single part farm payment review of decisions procedure? Yes, um, the member may be aware that um, over the past year we've actually improved things greatly, particularly at the first stage. We're also working then on the, on the further stage. So there's an ongoing piece of work. I don't have the figures with me now, but I can certainly say that the figures will speak for themselves in terms of the improvements that have been made. But I'm very happy to provide that for the member in writing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for her question. Um, does the Minister find it acceptable that there are farmers within our, many of our rural communities, and I'm sure she has constituents like me who have been waiting in excess of six months now um, for a decision? Does she believe that that position is either acceptable or should be continued into the future? No, absolutely don't think it's acceptable, which is why um, we had a review of the whole process and we have improved things significantly. Um, Happy if the member wants to write to me outside of question time, obviously, in terms of the case that he's um, dealing with. But uh, we have improved things. We'll continue to improve things, particularly at the first stage. There's been massive um, change. The second stage, then, is, is an ongoing piece of work also. Oliver McMullen. Mr McMullen. Uh, would the minister share my concerns in relation to the beef sector? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, difficult time for the beef sector. The drop in prices has, uh, has been, um, over the last number of weeks, has been um, something that's been a topic of conversation, very much so, and, and the forefront of everybody's minds. We all want to see a strong, profitable red meat sector, and that can only be achieved if farmers are going to receive a fair return for the, their quality 
um, traceable produce. So that's something that obviously is with, um, in terms of pricing as a commercial matter, not within my remit, but I understand that farmers, um, uh, particularly given the proposed changes that we've seen um, for the incentive structure for inspect, inspect cattle over the recent while, I met with, with the processors, I've made my view very strong. This is not something that um, they can just impose on farmers, particularly given that farmers paid maybe high prices last autumn and not, not aware of any of these changes that were um, potentially coming forward. So, in my uh, opinion, that was poor business on the processors' behalf. I uh, am happy that they have appeared to have taken the decision off the table for the moment at least, but I think that it's very important that we stand strong together in terms of um, these, specifications, these changes that they're trying to bring in. People shouldn't be... Uh, these are, these are um, massive decisions that should not be taken without full consultation with the industry and how this was proposed to be done was to something that was totally not acceptable and something that I made sure they were very clear in my view on that. Well, can I thank the Minister for a comprehensive uh, uh, answer so far? But I'm sure the Minister will agree with me this is something that we should be addressing on an all iron basis. Can the Minister give some details on our discussions with Minister Coveney? Yes, um, we had ongoing discussions and actually at the NSMC meeting last Wednesday we had a discussion around um, what we can do together. I think in terms of us speaking with one voice, uh, particularly when it comes to dealing with um, these specifications are set down by the major supermarkets, particularly um, I feel that we need to do a round of meeting with those people to talk to them about our views and make sure that we're speaking with one voice, that we're speaking with a strong voice in terms of um, supporting the industry. Because I think that if things like this are allowed to happen now, what will come next year and the year after? So I think that th th there could be a domino effect here, which we need to be very strong on now and make sure that, that we're um, using whatever influence we can with these people. Uh, he was certainly up for that. He had also had a meeting with um, his stakeholders towards the end of last week and we've agreed to pick up a conversation again at the start of this week to agree um, what it is that we can do together to, to, to face on this issue. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Uh, due to the uncertainty that has created within the industry in relation to CAP reform and the, the implementation of CAP reform and how it's going to be brought forward, when is the minister going to bring it forward? And it comes back to a question which was asked earlier, which I didn't get a time nor a, a detail on. When is that going to be brought forward to the executive on the basis that we've had many consultations and we've known about this for not only months but for years? Well, I know the member won't be closely involved in all the discussions around cap reform, but um, the detail has been clarified bit by bit from Europe. We've been very much engaged at European level. We've been very much engaged with the industry and in listening to their views. This has been a massive consultation. It's been a massive piece of work. These are major changes, um, potentially, for, for the industry. So it's important that the decisions are taken. They're taken right. We are involved in political discussions around um, some of the key issues which we still have to take um, decisions on. As I've said earlier, we have clarified what we can clarify, and I'll continue to do that um, where possible. But I've listened to all views. I've very much taken on board all views. We do require um, political agreement on the issue, so um, those discussions are ongoing, and then I intend to make final decisions soon, as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the, the minister's answer, but it, it does not go any way towards addressing some of the fears that I've had from my community, which actually are telling me that they believe that the minister or the department are playing politics with their livelihood. Different, but I um, can assure you that I listen to the views of everybody, and I have done, and I will continue to. Um, the decisions that I will take will be based on fairness, will be based on equality, will be based on the best for the industry. Um, we're working our way through the process. As I've said, we have a political process to go through, um, and I'd like to be able to take decisions on those things sooner rather than later. The deadline for uh, Notifying Europe is August, but we'd like to be able to say that we have a decision taken way before August. In for a moment, uh, Kim Collier, Ira, given that the definition of an active farmer is going to change, is the Minister concerned about the impact of rural families trying to build on their own land? Yes, I um, actually have recently received a letter from um, DOE Minister around seeking some clarification, and I've asked officials to engage with his officials because I do think it's important. Um, we've been fighting a very long, everybody who represents rural communities has been fighting a long battle for um, rural communities, for rural people to be able to build on their own land. So it's important that any changes that come about as a result of um, active farmer, that, that that is not something that impacts on, on people who want to build on their own land. So I will engage with the DOE Minister to make sure that that's the case. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Uh, will the Minister ensure that full correspondence occur between her department and the DOE so that there is no grey area for rural people wanting to build post um, new cap reform? Yes, absolutely. I can give that assurance. Um, as I said, I represent the rural community also, same constituents as yourself. So we're very used to dealing with and, and um, having heated discussions with planners around um, rural people being able to build on their own land. So um, I'll make sure that at every level, at ministerial level and also at official level, that those conversations are had and make sure that there's no um, confusion out there in terms of um, people's uh, entitlement to, to be able to build on their own land. Dolores Kelly is not in her place. That concludes question time. Could I say to the whole House that a number of members have been missing from the Chamber this afternoon during question time. And I can understand members' minds might be somewhere else at this moment in time, but I really do have to say if members are putting down questions to ministers, they should be in the House. There is a responsibility for members to be in the House. And today I believe there may have been up to six members. Either topical questions or all questions were not in the House. And I would hope those members would come to the House, give a reason, and apologise to this House, and especially to our ministers. Let us move on.